ideally, you have people forming up opinions and desires and then voting for a government that represents them. But we know it works both ways. The government has enormous power to shape the opinions and desires of the population. Mm -hmm. And this power only increases today with uh, the new technologies of surveillance, uh, mass surveillance, and social media, and so forth. So when the government can, sh I mean, the government is not just responsive to the will of the people. It can shape the will of the people. And this really destabilizes the democratic system. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, the media has an enormous role to play in this. That if the government has too much control over the media, then it's not like people are forming their own independent views about what's happening. We now have the power, or at least not we, but some gov governments and corporations for the first time in history have the power to basically hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers, hacking smartphones, hacking bank accounts, but the big story of our era is the ability to hack human beings. And by this I mean that if you have enough data and you have enough computing power, you can understand people better than they understand themselves, mm -hmm. and then you can manipulate them in ways which were previously impossible. Mm -hmm. and in such a situation, the old democratic system stopped functioning. We need to reinvent democracy for this new era in which humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election, or whether in the supermarket this is my free will, that's over. We need to come to terms with the fact that, you no know, matter again, it, this is where philosophy meets computer science and biology. Uh, no matter what you think ultimately is the truth of the universe, you have to realize that practically today we have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. And this means you need, we need to reinvent democracy we need, we need to reinvent the market. Again, the whole idea of the customer is always right. We just do whatever the customers want. Yes, but you can now hack the customers. You can manipulate the customers to, to want what you tell them to want. So this whole idea that corporations just serve the needs of the customers, this is, this is over. You can't hide behind this explanation anymore. Maybe the pandemic, is, this disruption of a world pandemic is an opportunity mm. for a change that, that we might need listening to you. Um, of course, after 10 months of uh, <laughs> COVID, um, nothing will take us back to December 19. But can we begin to imagine a new reality of a post-pandemic world? Um, you know, the job market, the mm. real estate businesses, uh, the family, the leisure culture, performing arts, uh, everything changes right now. Yeah, we need, I mean, we have no choice. We need to reimagine an old future, a new future because we can't go back to the past. It's impossible. The, I mean, even before COVID. The vaccine won't help us go the to vaccine the test, of course. The vaccine will help <laughs> us, of course. It will make things you know, more manageable. But it won't but take the time back. It, we can't go back. We were already in a process of rapid change fueled by new technologies. COVID just accelerated it. Changes that we thought would take 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. like moving a lot of courses in the university online, they happened within two, two three weeks mm -hmm. or two, three months because of COVID but they were already underway anyway. There's now so, no reason to live close to work or close to the academic center. Yeah. There's no, um, um, the city centers are not, are losing their function right now. Yeah, I mean, everything is being digitalized. Everything is being monitored. And the elderly are isolated. You have, a, not only the elderly, also, also, also the young are isolated. Um, and we are in the midst of a tremendous social upheaval. We can't go back, but it doesn't mean that the future has to be bad. Uh, it, it's, it's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste. 
because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to, but in a crisis you see we have no chance, so, 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 so let's do it. And you know, we can react to this crisis in very different ways. You can react to the crisis by generating hatred, blaming the epidemic on foreigners, on minorities. You can react to the epidemic by generating greed. How do I make as much money out of it as possible? You can react by generating ignorance, inventing and spreading all kinds of ridiculous conspiracy theories. Uh, Bill Gates created this epidemic in a laboratory to take over the world. Or you can react by generating wisdom, um, believing science, realizing that in this time of crisis you have to follow science, not these conspiracy theories. You generate not hatred, but compassion, finding ways to cooperate with people in your country and all over the world. Because, you know, the big advantage of humans over viruses is that we can cooperate in ways the virus can't. A virus in China can't give advice to a virus in the U.S. about how to infect people. Mm -hmm. But doctors in China, in the U.S., and Israel, and Brazil can come together, share information, share uh, the results of their observations, experiments, in order to develop treatments, vaccines. And, you know, it's not just insights about the virus. It's also psychological insights, economic insights. Countries all over the world are facing the same problems. Uh, why should every country repeat the same mistake? Mm -hmm. I mean, if one country tried something and now it realizes the, the economic and psychological damage of its wrong decision, it should freely share this information with other countries. We need this kind of global cooperation. We need a global safety net to protect the weakest members of humankind from not just the epidemic, but the economic consequences. If we do that, we'll be able to not just face this crisis, but face much bigger future crises, like the ongoing climate emergency and the rise of artificial intelligence and automation, we'll be able to face them much better. On the other hand, if we, you know, COVID, historically speaking, is a relatively small crisis. As a disease, it's a relatively mild epidemic. It kills something less than 1% mm -hmm. of mortality. This is nothing like the Black Death of the big influenza of 1918 or AIDS. AIDS in the 1980s, you got AIDS, you died. 100% mortality. Mm -hmm. So COVID is a very mild disease in comparison. It's like nature has been throwing us a practice ball. Let's see how you deal with that before I really bring out the big guns like climate change and like the rise of AI. Mm -hmm. If we can't unite as a species against this virus, then our chances against the ecological crisis and against the technological disruption of AI and bioengineering is really, really um, you know, distressing to think about it.